Uh, we will start momentarily. We'll just wait for a few minutes for the others to join us. Thank you for your patience. Start also. So good morning, everyone. Uh, the uh, California Association of Healthcare Leaders in partnership with uh, San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders would like to welcome you again uh, to our uh, second week of series five of our uh, Board of Governors exam prep. So uh, we will be tackling today the uh, healthcare finance, which is 24, uh, 24 uh, questions, 12%. And the human resources, which is 22 questions, which comprises 11% of the questions. Um, before we will pros, uh, we'll move forward with our uh, uh, agenda today. I would like to uh, thank you all again for being with us. You know, it's Saturday and you're here. It just shows your dedication to your fellow journey. And thank you. And uh, I would like also to remind everyone to please, please feel free to. Uh, send us any question at the chat box and, uh, and, and we will try our best to answer all your questions. And we would like this uh, presentation to be uh, interactive as possible. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the next slide, please. So once again, your, uh, your uh, um, team members are here, are, are all here to help you. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Michael DeCoco. Uh, Nor Powers. Rick Nairai. Tachin Gangapantula. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tweedo. And we have our partners from San Diego. Uh, James Reynolds. And next slide, please. Um, Nora, would you uh, take it away for the updates for the FAQs? Yeah, just a couple of quick updates that beginning back on the 1st through June 30th, if you submit your application and get accepted um, for advancement, ACHE will waive the exam fee. And re this is what we recommend. If you can, go ahead and submit your packet and get and get accepted, go ahead and take the exam, take it for free. Who knows, you may pass. Um, even if you don't feel prepared, it could always, it can't hurt. I think, I think you have to wait 60 days between exams though, if you don't pass the first one, I think there's a time frame. But um, for, the, for the people that we've known that have done it, it's been great because a lot of them pass, who knew? So we recommend that. Um, also, again, we'll be sending out a survey monkey at the end of the series. Again, we do take this very, very seriously. And the great program that you're experiencing now is because of former participants giving us great feedback. Um, next slide. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna give you some exam test taking tips that we gave last time. And this time we have Sachin, our special guest speaker who recently passed the exam and can give you his insight into how he used some of these techniques. So again, relax, breathe, use some of this heart-focused breathing technique. It helps calm me down before each, what, each of these sessions, so it works. Um, remember um, to read each of the options as true-false. That'll help at least eliminate the ones that are can appear to be false. Re and reread each question several times, because again, you may miss the actual point of the question. Beware of qualifiers or, you know, those uh, concepts, you know, like say all of the above, all except, sometimes only. Be careful of those and be sure that you're focusing in on those. Do not stress on time frames, you have six hours, um, you have time for breaks. And the beauty of this um, computerized exam is that you can mark questions for review and come back to them later. Um, so at this point time, I'd like to turn it over to Sachin so he can give you some of his perspective of how he prepared. Thank you, Nora. 
Thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us this morning. Um, I've been part of the committee for I think a year or a year and a half or so. And um, it did give me enough time between my practice here and uh, for, uh, volunteering for Cal to spend time on preparing. But <clears throat> I do want to say how beneficial uh, these sessions have been personally. Um, and in fact, I do want to take a minute. Um, I just received a couple of days ago uh, a, a testimony from one of our recent fellows, uh, Edmund Chan. <clears throat> it says, regarding the journey to FACI, I found that Cal's Saturday prep sessions were extremely helpful in understanding the test questions from a national perspective. I also appreciated you and the other preceptors in sharing resources. The practice exam questions and Quizlet were invaluable. Thank you for reaching out and for your ongoing advocacy and support for future fellows. So this kind of gives uh, us uh, a moment to appreciate uh, all of the folks who are on the board here today, but also um, the efforts that um, Nora and Sherry, who for the last several years have been helping others, including myself, uh, to help us take these exams. Um, so definitely a great resource. Uh, and uh, we, we hope that you take the most advantage of um, all the content we've been providing. So I uh, took the exam in uh, October, oh, no, sorry, December. Um, and um, it was, um, I think, you know, the first time for me, but I definitely felt a little um, anxious about, you know, the number of hours. But uh, as uh, Nora was saying, um, it's actually a good time frame, six hours, and um, do not rush into it. That's what I've kept repeating myself. And um, in fact, even though I had enough time and I took a couple of breaks, I was able to get them through within, I think, four and a half hours or so. And I was, I wanted to make sure I wanted to go back and, and look at answers again. But that comes to the next uh, advice I always have is when, when you answer a question and you're sure about it, um, you don't have to revisit it. Um, I've realized uh, in the past when I did some other practice exams, I don't overthink it. And... Um, if you've gotten it the first time, you're usually right. I also uh, take Rick's advice on that. <clears throat> um, one of the other things that has really benefited um, uh, during these sessions was um, about how you eliminate choices. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's impossible to cover every topic that uh, the BOG covers. Uh, in fact, I was not able to cover a few topics myself. I just had to skim through it. So you have to be uh, comfortable to know that you don't know 100% of everything, but uh, understanding how to approach the test taking will help you immensely. So going back to the second option here, a second uh, advice here, which is read each of the options as true or false, um, helps you immensely in actually eliminating choices. And um, read and read each question is very critical because I've seen some of those questions can get long uh, sometimes almost three to four lines as, as good as a paragraph. So just take your time in, in reading those questions. There is enough time and, and uh, it will help you kind of eliminate um, the choices. They do give you a, a pen and paper so you can always uh, write out those if this, you know, in your own um, words to if it helps you as well. This time I didn't get a lot of all of the above or all except I just got one or two. But that's definitely a tricky question. So you gotta just make sure that you're choosing the right answers based on those um, words that you see here. Um, and the last one, mark questions for review also is helpful, especially when you have topics you haven't read through and you're not sure about it. Just mark them for review. It, it helps you to go back and um, review the 10 or 12 questions you have marked. Um, definitely answer, choose an answer before you mark it for review so that you're not losing the opportunity to answer a question because there is no negative marking. So do not leave any question unanswered. A um, couple of other things that I remember. <clears throat> um, I did go through Quizlet and a few other um, online um, resources where they had a lot of questions. Uh, what I've noticed in this exam is that they have not repeated a lot of questions. I probably can, out of 230, uh, probably say 10 or 15 questions uh, they're exactly word to word, but um, which means the majority of it is on the topic, but they actually have variations um, on those questions as well. And um, what else? Oh, your experience counts. So 
you know, part of the reason why BOG or ACHE recommends or requires you to have at least five years of healthcare experience is because they do bring a lot of that experience into these exams. In fact, the committee that actually is entrusted with making these questions are also a lot experienced. Uh, I think Michael was one of those members in the past. Um, so you, you are already strong in, in those areas that you, that's your day job. So do not underestimate that because you get a lot of questions that um, help you in that regard. Uh, from my practice, um, as an independent practice here, I have deal, dealt with a lot with uh, accountable care organizations, value-based care, and there were several questions actually um, that came through in that. And I didn't have to prepare much, but it also gave me confidence as you start seeing those questions. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, it's been a pleasure being part of this uh, group and committee, and I look forward to helping you and others in the future uh, with all the content that we are providing. And, and we look forward to having all of you on the Wall of Fame along with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much for those uh, very uh, excellent tips for the, for the you know, participants here today. Um, We'll proceed to the next slide, please. And this is for you, Thuy. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, so it's my pleasure today to um, introduce James Revels. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him while we were uh, back in, in San Diego a couple of years back. So my, how time flies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think back then we were part of the, the um, graduate student council for the soul chapter that James is a part of. Um, and he, he was a treasurer. Now he has promoted to uh, career development with the San Diego uh, organization of healthcare leaders, um, still in San Diego, uh, as I have moved back up here to Sacramento and changed my alliances. So thank you for being here with us, James. Um, and he currently is a uh, service line financial manager at UC uh, San Diego, and he's graduated with the Master's of Advanced Studies in um, Leadership of Healthcare Organizations. So with our series of, of questions that he will be going through, um, yeah, he's, he's a wonderful expert in, in finance. So uh, I, I hope that the chat today will be engaging and um, I don't know, rapid fire him. So you could, you know, pop quiz him <laughs> to test his knowledge <laughs> on it. <laughs> thank you so much, James, for being here. Oh, no, thank you all. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to help you through this journey. Um, and uh, I, you know, like we said, uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, it being very interactive. So I'm, I'm willing to help you, you know, looking forward to help you through this process. And um, we'll be able to, you know, welcome any questions you have and, and addressing them. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, so we're gonna touch on a variety of, of finance topics. And this is from operating capital budgeting, uh, some financial principles, uh, reimbursement methodologies. Um, we'll talk about productivity measures, financial controls, and a whole host of financial topics. Um, uh, uh, so we'll kind of go through those um, do these practice questions. And you know, again, if, uh, you know, something you don't understand uh, from what I described, um, certainly I'll be willing to stop and, and explain that to you. So with that, I think we can, we can move on to the, um, to the practice questions. Okay, so the first question to ask us, uh, during the investigation of merger or acquisition, why would it be prudent uh, for a healthcare executive to obtain advice from someone other than internal legal counsel. So um, the, first, uh, the first option here, A, um, the regular legal counsel may not be objective. Well, I, this may be true. I think uh, probably the, the uh, broader concern is that um, they may not have experience in dealing with mergers and acquisitions. So keep that in mind as, you know, as we're trying to answer these um, questions. Uh, so probably you can eliminate A as, as, as possible choice. Um, B says external legal counsel may have expertise in joint ventures. Well, this could be a possible answer to this question. So let's keep that in mind um, as we review the remaining choices. And then C asks, says external legal counsel has the ability to provide the services in a more economic and timely manner. Well, certainly more timely, 
probably economic, not so much as it would be more costly to obtain uh, outside counsel. And then the last uh, answer is um, the specialized expertise that's needed in this area. So this was this one is um, again addresses I think the focus uh, on the um, on the questions being asked that you need a specialist dealing with mergers and acquisitions, which I think a lot of you've probably guessed at this point. The answer, correct answer is D. James, could I jump in on this also? Sure, um, go ahead. B is uh, may have experience, and if you're if you're hiring outside counsel, they better have that experience. So. Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't hire someone without the experience. So I would eliminate B on that. Or yeah. D is a better answer for sure. Yeah, I think, and D is also, a, um, to your point, is a, a broader answer. So between B and D, D represents um, more broader choice. Although, you know, there are two or B and D are po po both possible ones, but D is, I think, the more broadest answer, I think. And that's where the key driver is this. Okay. So uh, this next one is um, ratio of output to input is a measure of, well, when we talk about, let's, let's define what input and output are. So input are like labor hours and capital um, and uh, natural resources. Well, outputs are things like measure of sales or number of goods and services produced. So think about that uh, when you attempt to answer this question. So, um, and what they're measures of. So um, liquidity ratio is really used to determine a, a company's ability to pay its short-term obligations. So that's probably not a good, uh, good choice. Um, process really speaks to the accuracy of the process being measured and the, you know, the instrument used to making that measurement. So um, B doesn't really fit well, well within that. Um, and then C, uh, productivity. So these, uh, we've, what we're describing here on the outputs and inputs, they seem to be all things that we would use as uh, what a company would produce um, when it's produces product or services or being a part of the production process. So C seems like that would be a good and a good choice. Um, and then uh, D, um, the work environment describes the surrounding conditions that an employee operates. So really that may not fit well within the output to input, but um, I think the key driver is we're using outputs which I described in the in the inputs as a part of the production process. So productivity seems fit well within that definition. So I would choose C as an answer, or, or it's the best answer, I think, in this case. And the answer is C. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's let's go on to the next one. Um, so a hospital continuously assesses the interests of the community, of the community and searches for ways to meet the inter these interests can be described as, well, the first one is predatory. Uh, that doesn't sound good. And these really refer to unfair business practices such as misrepresentation or false advertising. So you definitely eliminate A as a choice. Market orientation is, you know, you're prioritizing the needs and desires of the customers creating products and services that, uh, that will satisfy them. So that seems to fit well within what we're being asked. So that's a possible answer, B. Uh, C is market optimization. That, that you're optimizing your marketing efforts in order to um, reach the desired business outcome. So probably not C. And then differentiation refers to the um, principle of setting your company apart through some specific elements such as uh, pricing. So really it's not addressing what we're being asked here. I think um, in this case, the, the best, best answer is, is going to uh, be the uh, market-oriented um, B. The answer is B. OK, let's go on to the next one. So uh, net income as a percent of gross revenues and return on equity are two most important indicators of, well, it mentions net income in the question. So, um, and then return on equity. So these, these seems, uh, so the first choice profitability seems like that, that could be a good answer to this question, particularly what, what is being asked. Um, credit worthiness is, is your likelihood uh, to meet your debt obligations and, and receive new credit. So that probably wouldn't be fit well within what's being asked. So you can eliminate B. Market strength uh, really refers to the market's ability to perform on a relative basis within other markets or uh, based on historical level. So that probably doesn't fit well within this question. So I would eliminate C. 
And then cash position is the amount of cash a company has on its books um, at any point in time. Uh, so that really doesn't address the net income or return on equity questions. So I think you can eliminate D as well. So I, I would choose um, A. And the answer is A. Okay. Okay. Um, um, when reviewing elements, which uh, which element is the most important indication of an organization's liquidity? So when we think about liquidity, um, uh, let's define that. It, it, it's really the extent to which uh, the current assets of a company covers its short-term obligations. So think about that definition when we when you attempt to answer this question. So buildings and equipment, that's a long-term asset. So that, that wouldn't fit within that definition. Long-term investments got long-term in the, in the answer. So no, probably not. And then cash and short-term investments. Well, short-term investments and cash are current assets on the balance sheet. So that, that would sounds like a likely choice. And then finally, land and other assets is another long-term asset. So um, I would choose C. Um, since we're, we're looking at uh, the, our current assets and its, uh, its ability to cover that short-term obligation. So I think C is the best answer. Yeah, so uh, this is Michael. There, there are mixed answers here. Some uh, chose C and some are D, so there's quite a... Yeah. yeah, so um, I keep in mind that A, B, and D are all long-term assets. And when we talk about liquidity, we're, we're attempting to see that a company's ability to a coverage short-term obligation. So that's why A, B, and D would not fit within the answer. So you can eliminate those. The ability to understand what's a current versus a long-term asset helps you answer this question. Okay. So financial statements are important in order to, uh, so the first uh, uh, answer is identify, measure, record, communicate in dollar terms the economic events and status of, the, of an organization. Well, the financial statements do all those things. So that would be one possible answer. Serve as a control mechanism for budgeting. Well, this means you're taking your actual the budget figures and performing variance analysis on your financial statements. So that is another possible use of the financial statements. So B is another possible answer. C is to provide detailed financial information for control at the department level. Well, this information is not contained in your financial statements. It's in your subsidiary ledger, such as a payroll system. Um, uh, so probably C can only be eliminated. And providing staffing guidelines uh, to human resource manager. This is really a, um, this represents, uh, this is independent of your financial statements and is really a financial control. So you can eliminate D as well. So here, I think that probably the best answer between A and B would probably be A. It's a primary use um, and an important to the financial statement. Just a quick comment. Uh, this is Sachin. This goes back to another comment we had before, which is when you are choosing your answers, look for one that has the broadest scope of it. Uh, it always helps to think that way rather than, because each of these answers could really serve in some way, indirectly or directly, the purpose of financial statements, but always look for the broadest choice. Yeah, because really B is a, like an ancillary um, use of financial statements. So it's probably not the primary purpose behind it. So A is probably uh, uh, to the point we just made is a, a broader answer when we're defining what uh, the important uses of a financial statement. And uh, uh, this is Michael, is the, is the answer A also related to fina uh, financial accounting? Yeah, it's, it, yeah, whether it, um, financial accounting, yeah. whether it's managerial or financial, um, uh, it still would be A. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so this, this uh, question really tests your knowledge on the different types of opinions that um, when you're being audited, the auditor can issue on your financial statements. So um, uh, it asked in most questions, in most cases, the most favorable audit opinion an organization can receive is A, qualified opinion, Excuse me. So that's when the auditor is not confident about any specific process or transaction and they issue a qualified opinion. So you could probably eliminate A. B, adverse opinion. It's probably the worst type of opinion can be given on a financial statement. So um, that's when they're not satisfied at all with the uh, financial statements. And, and there's a high level of material misstatement. 
So B can be eliminated. C, they're disclaiming the opinion, so they're not offering any type of opinion at all. They're disassociating themselves with the financial statements, so you can eliminate C. And then D, um, unqualified opinion represents a clean report, and really it's, it's the type of an opinion that most businesses expect to receive from the auditor. So a D, I think, is the best choice here, which I think of many of you already, sounds like many of you already kind of guessed that, so that's good. And, and for me, if I'm, I'm uh, taking this exam, so I have to take note on the, the, the question is positive and the answer is negative, most favorable and the, and the answer is unqualified. So it doesn't match in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, you know, wording. So, so that's, it, that can be confusing, right? So that's why we have to know the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the name or the, or the meaning of qualified and unqualified for this uh, question. So. Yeah, but the and the other thing I would mention is <clears throat> when you look look at the um, the choices with disclaimer and adverse that that's the, what those don't sound very good. You're not issuing an opinion or it's, you have an adverse opinion. So B and C may be something you can eliminate right off the bat. Um, and then qualify sounds like you're qualifying your opinion really to a specific issue. So I think you think about it in those terms. It may be helpful in answering the question. One uh, one thing to be careful of here is that you're talking about the opinion and not the person giving it in terms of qualified, unqualified. So mm -hmm. again, you have to read the the question carefully to say you know it's the opinion that you receive and not your auditor. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's another good point. Okay. The purpose of the statement of operations or income statement is to <clears throat> so th this question is going to test your knowledge, uh, the purpose behind the different types of financial statements. So just um, I think th this is going to really uh, help to understand what each type of financial statement is used for. Um, so the first uh, option, A, um, the purpose of the financial statement operations or income statement is to present the financial position of the organization at a specific point in time. This describes a balance sheet. Um, so it's probably not going to be A presents the reasons net assets change from one period to another. That's your statement of changes in equity. So it's not gonna be B. Presents cash receipts and disbursements and where they um, came from or went during the accounting period. So it's not gonna be C. Then D is, it says presents the operating results of the organization over a period of time. Or it mentions operating results and that question's asking about a statement of operations. So that kind of gives you a, a clue on, you know, what the answer could be. and. It mentions over a period of time, which um, your income summary covers over your operating cycle, which is usually a course of the, through the course of a year. So those are two kind of clues you can look to. Um, but I think overall, you just have a base, have a, a general understanding of the financial statements and what they're used for will help answering this question. And the answer is D. Okay. Okay, so this one is ratios that measure an organization's long-term liquidity are called. Well, let's define what long-term liquidity is. It measures the extent to which the capital employed in the business can be financed either through debt or equity, and it involves um, uh, long-term borrowing. So with that, that information, uh, the first option is liquidity ratio, and that really um, speaks to the, um, the business's ability um, to pay off its uh, current debt ob obligations without raising outside capital. So that's um, probably not a likely answer. So you can limit A. Profitability ratios really speaks to, uh, it's a financial metric assessing the business's um, uh, ability to generate its earnings relative to its, to its revenue, operating assets, and equity. So it's probably not going to be B. A capital structure ratio, uh, really this speaks to um, uh, versus the company's mix of capital, which includes debt and equity. And it could be short and long-term. Um, and both of things are used when analyzing a company's capital structure ratio. Um, so C sounds like it would be a lot, um, a logical answer since it's involving, involving long-term debt. Um, and then D, uh, really efficiency ratio is, is the company's ability to generate um, income uh, based on its use of the assets. So a D probably can be eliminated as well. 
Um, so I, I think the best answer, since it involves uh, uh, analyzing both short and long-term debt, it's probably going to be C. Okay, and so this really tests your your knowledge of the different type of ratios that are used in financial statements, and um, how they're used, and the purpose behind them. Okay, so the purpose of the of the strategic financial plan is to well, let's before we get into these answers, let's talk about what a strategic financial plan is. It really, it's a set of overall goals um, for your business. And, and a plan to develop to achieve them. It takes a step back from the day-to-day -day operations and um, ask you where your business is headed and what your priorities should be. It, it means assessing your financial needs and, and the resources required to meet your objectives. So that's really what our strategic financial plan is. So keep that in mind when you're attempting to answer this question. Uh, look into the future 10 years to determine what the business will look like. Well. That's really not part of the definition, although it's contained in the strategic financial plan. It's really not um, the purpose behind the fin strategic financial plan. Translate the strategic plan into next year's objectives. Well, you're taking a step back from the day-to-day -day operations, so probably not going to be B. Convert the operating plan to monetary terms. Again, um, you're, you're assessing um, you know, what your financial needs and the resources are, are needed as a part of this. So it's probably not going to be C. And identify resources uh, that will be necessary to accomplish strategic plan. And that's part of the definition behind a strategic financial plan is you're assessing what resources you need to meet your objectives. So I would see the best answer here is it's probably going to be D. Okay, and it's D. So again, keep in mind of the purpose behind a strategic financial plan and think about that as, as you're attempting to answer this question because some of these are a little bit tricky, you know, and, um, and they may have components of a strategic financial plan, but just keep in mind what the primary purpose behind um, your strategic uh, planning is. So a zero-based plan or budget can be described as so let's talk about a zero-based budget, what that is. You're starting from scratch. It's starting from zero. That means you're not using your prior your actuals or, or budget as a baseline in developing the budget. You're starting from zero. So the first option is starting each plan or budget cycle with a clean slate. Well, that seems like a pretty good definition of what a zero-based budget is. Adjusting expenses based on realized volumes. Well, you're not doing that because you're starting from scratch allowing unencumbered funds to be transferred next year. You're not doing that because again, you're starting from zero and limiting department managers only expenses they control. You could take that out uh, as a possible choice as well. So uh, I think A is probably the best choice here. And it's A. So look, you know, I think it would be helpful just kind of look at the, um, and when you're reading through this question, um, a zero-based plan, think about that and you know, what, what that question is asking. And then when you review the choices, to try to connect that with, with the question. So I, I think it will help you in, in answering this and eliminating choices as well. Okay. Okay, so um, the managed care plans that exerts the most control over providers and for save, save the most money in provider payments. So this, this is uh, more of a, uh, so th this is an interesting one. So really test your knowledge of the different types of uh, plans that are out there. So an indemnity plan is probably has the most freedom and flexibility. You're not going through any particular provider network. So you can eliminate that one right after the bat. A preferred provider organization, um, you know, this is a network of hospitals and physicians um, that are purchasing providers and, um, you know, the member can go inside or outside the network. So again, it has a lot of freedom and flexibility. You can only that one as a choice. Close panel HMOs, those, those are employed by the health, physicians employed by the health plan and uh, members are, um, they see patients who are members of the HMO. So that's a pretty good definition behind um, in terms of controlling cost. And then point of service HMO is a hybrid between um, the HMO we just described in the preferred provider organization. So it still has uh, some flexibility, um, 
So I think here the C is probably the best answer. Okay, great. And it sounds like a lot of you already kind of guessed that, so that's good. Okay, so this one asks a productivity measure that takes into account the level of skill required to accomplish the task. So let's talk about what a productivity measure is. It's just a common way to, um, to measure uh, labor productivity um, that takes into account compensation and the number of hours worked. So think about that when you're, you're attempting to answer this question. So the first choice is an hourly rate. Well, it really doesn't take into account the skill required to accomplish a particular task. So eliminate A. Both B and C, either planned or actual uh, paid hours per unit of service, again, doesn't take into account the level of skill required. So probably B and C can be eliminated as well. Uh, labor compensation per unit of service. So it, it takes con consideration that what is paid uh, for uh, performance doing the work on that particular uh, task on a per unit of service basis does take into account the skill required to accomplish the task. So I think D is probably the best answer here. And the answer is D. But why isn't A the labor compensation? Um, a wouldn't be because uh, you don't, it's asking for a skill required to accomplish uh, uh, the task at hand. So A would just be an overall hourly rate. I don't know, it's, it wouldn't be specific to, to the task that's being performed. And, and here you're, you're looking at both the units of service uh, that's part of the task and the labor compensation, which take into account the, the skill set um, you know, the mix of employees that are required to accomplish that work. So um, I think that's why you can eliminate A, because I don't know, it's not clear in this question, but I, I would say that the hourly rate um, doesn't seem to um, be specific to the, to the task that's being done. That, I think D here, I mean, A, in, between A and D, D is more um, the, uh, more the obvious choice because when you're measuring a productivity measure, you're taking into account um, uh, the labor compensation and the hours required to do the work. So you're you're taking consideration of both those things and that there are by by part of the definition of what a productivity measure is. So that that gives you a good clue on what the answer is in this in this uh, question. There's Yes, I think uh, there's a confusion. Uh, the the answers uh, are mixed. It's B and D. So uh, uh, the answer here from the uh, from the participants, uh, it's B and D. So I think there's a uh, you know maybe uh, the paid hours probably. Yeah, but that you don't you have paid hours per unit you know, service, but you don't. Um, it it doesn't take into account the. Um, this oh, you know, it's the number of hours that, that the uh, something's worked on the project, but it doesn't consider that the type of uh, people that are involved, the different types okay. of positions that are involved in the task that's being done. You just know how many hours they've worked on the job, but you don't know uh, the different skill sets they're required yeah. to accomplish. Yeah, so yeah, basically the D is the best because it measures, uh, it, it, it compasses the skill mix and everything of all the departments. Of of the right. Unit. Yeah, it, it, it takes into account the, the skills, uh, the skill mix, I guess, is requiring the accomplish the task. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, before I move forward, I think there is a question in the chat. Um, sure. It says each unit of uh, service requires a different skill. Each unit requires different skill. I mean, I yeah, I think depending what I guess depending on what the task is, um, it may require a different uh, skill set. Um, so depend yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Each, if, each if, task would, would be different and would yeah. would require if, a different skill mix. So for, yeah. So for example, you know, one unit. Uh, for example, I would I, I would like to get, give an example. A unit of la a laboratory unit. So there's. Uh, there's a different skill set there, skill mix. We have the right. scientist, we have the phlebotomist, we have the secretary. So yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of skill sets in there. Right. Yeah, and that's where the labor compensation piece comes yeah. into the, you know, into the calculation. So um, 
and that's you know, basically why it's, it's a better answer. Great, thank you. Um, sure. I think she was, oh yeah, she said she was reinstating it. Okay, oh, <laughs> I'm just saying it, thanks Julie. <laughs> okay, um, but I mean, overall I would say, you know, um, keep in mind, um, I always, when answering these questions, I kind of keep in mind, you know, what the, what the concept uh, they're trying to get across in these, these different types of questions and, you know, understand the definition behind that um, or the concept behind what the, what's being asked. And that really helps in answering some of these questions. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, we are done with finance. Thank you very much, James, for that very insightful uh, discussions of the questions. Sure. And, um, I, before we'll proceed with the uh, human resources, I would like to, you know, open the uh, table for any additional questions based on what you've seen today uh, for the first few hour minutes. And so I, I have a quick question on the finance stuff. Uh, it, as we do this, it, it, are the questions that we went over today similar to what we'd experience on the exam? My question is, are there any practical things where like you see a balance sheet and have to analyze it? Or is it straight up multiple choice like we've seen over? I would uh, answer that question as a person who took the exam. Yes, there's a lot of balance sheets and everything and uh, questions during the exam. Uh, Shashan, what's your experience about balance sheets, statement of operations, questions? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much straight up multiple choice uh, in terms of understanding the purpose of those. That's all they've uh, focused on. Um, there was never any, I think, in fact, finance related, um, there was not any problems involving any calculations or even interpreting the numbers in any form, so. If there are calculations in finance, it's very basic where you can just, you know, uh, calculate using the pencil that they provide you at the paper, right? Yep, pretty much, yeah. Okay, so let's go to uh, the human resources. I'd like to uh, uh, introduce, and it's my honor to, uh, to introduce to you our uh, guest speaker for human resources. So uh, she is uh, currently the, uh, uh, before I will tell what she's currently doing is, uh, Sherry Ambrose has been the, uh, you know, uh, is one of the instrumental person in making this uh, uh, online session review materialize. So because, uh, she was she used to be the chair of the advancement committee, and I'm just I am just uh, following her footsteps, and which is a big uh, you know uh, uh, big function or role to to uh, to uh, do. So uh, she's currently the adjunct professor for University of San Francisco School of Nursing and Health Professions, and uh, currently she's also a nurse uh, consultant at the B. B. Smith and had been awarded for Daisy Award Champion Honorary for, uh, from, uh, in 2018. So um, it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you and present to you Sherry Ambrose. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you, Sasha, Nora, Richard, James, and uh, Tui. I appreciate uh, being able to come back. Um, this picture kind of represents last uh, couple sessions, we do a beach scene. So I finally got to do a beach scene in person. Um, so this is in Maui, but uh, I do appreciate uh, being back here to uh, support you in your journey to become a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Execs. So we'll start out with the content, a little bit uh, of an overview for human resources. What's been mentioned is absolutely true uh, in terms of your experience and where you've come from in your career in human resources, either as a director, manager, a participant in an organization. Um, this will come into play in this particular session. And I like that it follows finance because there are some comparable topics that are uh, covered in terms of staffing and individuals, people management, as you will in HR does take productivity management and so forth. Um, so it's nice that we are blending the two topics together. Uh, when I studied for the human resources section, as I did some of the other sections, I would take a look at the laws and regulations and put them in a grid. There's quite a few in this area. 
um, as it relates to um, some of the topics covered in the first bullet point there. So I would put it in a grid and then do a high level um, grid so that I could study it fairly quickly. And as has been mentioned, this is also true. This is a national test. So you won't be looking at local uh, or statewide um, regulations or benefit programs and things like that. You're gonna be thinking about it on a national level. Of course, recruitment and retention is gonna have even more importance for us now. Um, but as we go down the list, this is a great way to just set up your uh, study plan and, and be able to answer items and review different things in either the text or the uh, books that you're using for review. Motivation and developmental principles and techniques, you probably had some of that in um, your studies as you uh, have progressed up to the point that you're in. So you'll just, those will be a refresher. And engagement measurement improvement techniques, uh, again, that's something you rely on from your own uh, experience professionally and personally. And um, I do see a comment that it's good we don't have the California <laughs> laws, and that's, that's a, that is a, 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 a benefit of doing a national test. Um, and then our second uh, slide here, we'll just add a few more topics. We'll move to the next one. Um, and again, brings into play some of the national programs, OSHA, and uh, some of the things you'll see from a, a perspective related to um, uh, national uh, laws and regulations. When you look at conflict resolution and grievance procedures, some of that will take into the legal um, aspects of that work. And, um, and when we look about, uh, and that's why I do like that we are blending the two topics together. As you look at human resource decisions around people, the most important commodity we have in our work uh, force and with our uh, in our work settings is how that does affect operations, finance, and healthcare and quality of care. So great way to blend it all. And um, again, labor practices, labor relations. If you aren't working or haven't worked in a um, a labor environment, this is a good place to really study. Look at the collective bargaining agreement processes and some of the components of that. It's well outlined in um, some of the textbooks that you have available to you and some of the study guides. Succession so planning models, that's, in, that's important as well. And they will ask that really from the either the CEO perspective, the C perspective. I was a um, chief nurse prior to uh, joining USF as a a professor and also working with E. Smith in, in consulting roles. Um, and I always thought about the succession plan and had that in play when I uh, was in my roles. And they'll, they'll ask you about that too uh, in the test in some form or fashion. So we'll go ahead and go to the first question and um, we'll be using the same techniques that were provided to us before is look at the questions, read it really well. I love the way Nora used to tell read it backwards. <laughs> so read it forwards, which is following is a typical perform, perform during a background check, then look at background check and go backwards. And uh, think about it either personally, you've all probably had and or been involved in background checks or, or have had those reviewed if you were um, working in a team environment. So verification of finances, involvement in religious or political activities, previous employment or education claims, and prior performance of Al. So you got to think of this in terms of what's legal at this point. And we see a lot of C's and um, good choice. So you're, you're really narrowing it down um, as to what can be done. So we'll go uh, with the answer there. Good job all. Um, and the primary purpose of a well-developed performance appraisal system. And I do recall many questions asked about performance appraisal and that the model around that in HR, both in the study questions I reviewed before the exam and, and then within the exam. So when you look at this question, it's what we've been talking about is, is really analyze it as primary purpose. And so that narrows it uh, down um, and well-developed. So meaning we're looking at a very broad term there, performance appraisal. Uh, and what that does is it looks at our answers here from that perspective. Um, compare employees across the organization, um, not essentially when you're looking at a performance appraisal from an individual perspective, provide employees with development feedback and guidance. That's a very broad term. That's, that's um, 
a term that people are answering is B, right? Ensure employees understand the job they're supposed to be doing. I mean, that could be one component when you, when you do meet with somebody, but when you're doing a performance eval, you don't want them to know at that time that uh, they aren't doing their job well. It has to be done uh, prior to that and uh, before the actual performance eval. And we've all been taught that and determine how well managed management engages employees. It's not our look-see at what we do with our employees. It, it's to provide that uh, feedback. So as you look at this, the broadest answer is, uh, is B and you've answered that correctly. All right, next one. Um, with growing frequency, employees who have been dismissed are resorting to lawsuits for redress. In such cases, the court may find in favor of the plaintiff if the employer dismissed the plaintiff. So I think in this respect, I am gonna ask Rick to help us. Um, I'm gonna bring in legal counsel <laughs> and uh, have him go through this one because this is not uncommon in HR to request legal counsel. <laughs> Okay, I'm starting the clock. I will be billing for this. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so growing frequency. So that's just hinting there's a trend there. May or may not be important. Um, dealing with people who've been fired and they're suing. Okay, so why might the plaintiff win? Okay. Well, for cause. Now, if you get fired for cause, usually that's good. And progressive discipline is a good technique. It's certainly best practice. It's not legally required. Uh, being fired without cause, yeah, that's more likely to get you fired. And it depends on the state, but we're, we're looking national. We're not looking at California. Uh, before the end of the plaintiff's probation period, again, not a legal standard. Uh, it may show up in a, uh, in a collective bargaining agreement, but that's not a legal issue here. And for union organizing activities, oh, now, yeah, so... Um, you could get, if you're fired for, for that, definitely you're going to lose the lawsuit. So I'm going to eliminate uh, A and I'm going to eliminate C. And I'm going to go with B and D. Um, hmm. I would say B is going to be the broader one. Okay. Um, you know, D is definitely something that if you fire someone for that, you are gonna lose. But uh, at least I think Starbucks is figuring that one out, but it's, it's very, very specific. So I'm gonna go with B. Thank you, legal counsel. Appreciate your help with that. <laughs> um, so this can be tricky because um, it's with growing frequency and um, not using progressive discipline is a problem, but um, as Rick showed us, our, our thank you so much, is it's uh, the, the most inclusive, the broadest of answer. Um, so appreciate that. Uh, uh, this is Michael. I just wanna uh, remember, I remember last time that uh, there was a question about actual employment, right? Related. Is actual employment only for California? Termination of at will, like at will employment? Yeah, no, California is an at will state and some states are, but as a national rule, no. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's just gonna depend on each state, but that's one of those cases where California uh, definitely could lead you in the wrong direction. And there, there could, uh, as you look at for cause, but without progressive discipline, um, for cause, uh, unfortunately, in the nursing area where I worked in exclusively, if you've had a, um, uh, a negligent event that caused the death of an employee, uh, I'm sorry, a death of an employee, yes, a death of a, a, a patient, you didn't have to show progressive discipline in that case. So that's, a, that's why it's that's a, more of a specific question. Without cause is definitely um, um, more of a broader question. So. Yeah, the example I use in class is, you know, the surgeon who shows up drunk to operate, you're not going to really give a lot of warnings at that point. Exactly. You get him out of the operating room. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, which of the following would be considered the most effective approach to preventing the need for employee disciplinary? 
Um, so again, we're going to go, which of the following would be considered the most effective approach to preventing the need for employee disciplinary action? And it, again, I would take this. It's a longer question. Read it slowly. Which of the following would be considered the most effective approach to prevent the need for employee disciplinary action? So if you're looking at this question, you have some good answers here. Have an accurate job description. Yes, that's true. We did the true false. Have an employee orientation program. That's also true. You want to have that. Implementing a performance-based compensation system. That's one option to look at compensation. And giving managers a small span of control. Um, the, I don't disagree with that. Is uh, Span of control is a big topic in terms of what leaders can accomplish uh, in their work setting if they have a large span of control versus a smaller group of employees. So as we look at this again, we're gonna talk about job description and job description does, all roles kind of lead to job description in HR, meaning that you look at that in terms of how to improve your performance. You look at it if there's a problem with performance. Um, so as we take a look at that, um, Having an employee orientation program is a good answer in, from the perspective of uh, making sure the employee is uh, capable and has all the right tools to start their work. But really, when you're going back to look at employee performance, you're going to be looking at the job uh, description um, and the other C that relates to um, how we do look at the right way to um, uh, reimburse our employees. And then, as I mentioned, span of control is more of a management issue. So we'll look at the answer here. And we've got job description. And uh, it will be described, job description um, provides clarity. It tells you about the essential functions of work. And um, it will, you will kind of see that theme coming up when you're in the HR world, uh, it, it, according to the American College of Healthcare Execs, and I, I agree with that. Next uh, question, please. Which activity should precede the beginning, the start, the beginning of a recruitment process for a new employee? So how, do, how are we going to start out a new employee for success? Obtain information from employees in a similar position to assess the validity of the job description. Assess the cost of various forms of recruitment. Make a decision whether to emphasize internal or external recruitment. Conduct a job analysis. So this is not uncommon that you'll see questions that ask you to go in order, sequential order. So you think about it in terms of which activity should proceed. You're going to think this is a, a question asking you to go what in what order. So um, if you're looking at that order, you want to look at what's what's the best thing to do first. And um, the cost of various forms of recruitment, that's kind of ahead of yourself in terms of a recruitment process. Obtaining information from employees and similar to positions to assess the validity of the job description, you might not have uh, needed that yet. Um, but beginning a recruitment process for a new employee is looking at the job analysis. And a lot of you put D, and that's an excellent uh, answer for that. So just think about things that would make sense in order. Our next question. The evaluation of senior management is best administered. So looking at those individuals in higher level positions within an organization is when criteria is established and known to both parties. I would say that would be true on a scheduled periodic basis. That's also true. After consultation with the executive committee of the board, that um, we'll talk, you'll learn more about board uh, governance models and so forth, but that to me is sounding kind of off in conjunction with a salary adjustment. So as we talk about job descriptions and we talk about the best way to evaluate people, um, looking at these answers, uh, B could be right like we did on a periodic basis, but really the most highest level answer and the broadest and the one that we're looking at takes into account A, when criteria is established and known to both parties. So when you're evaluating anyone, 
that's a key piece in that. And uh, sure, and that's part of the job description as well, right? Those uh, criteria. That's exactly criteria based job descriptions, um, clarity of essential functions. And um, I think in terms of the senior management role as well is there's going to be a lot of uh, things that go beyond the job description. And you may have set up uh, key performance indicators that need to be accomplished within your role in senior management. You may have set up a goals, hopefully performance goals in the beginning of the year as we've done in some of the programs we work in when we do performance evals. And um, you have to know how you will be successful in that role, especially in senior management, in any management position, in any staff position. But senior management, you really need to understand what I will do to be successful in this role and have that criteria established with those that you work for. Just another comment, Sachin. Um, in a senior management role, obviously, the, it, it, part of the key compensation is also company results. Um, and that's where their goals come in. So it's important to understand that the job description and the compensation is tied to achieving those results. If the company doesn't do well, they may very well not get um, the entire compensation, but their performance is also e evaluated in that regard. Excellent point, Sasha, and thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great uh, thing to keep in mind. And, and I think as you're looking at this, uh, this this is a opportunity you look at okay senior management what what might be specific about that if it was looking across the board at all staff members or if it's looking across the board at clinicians um, you'll look at it a little differently but thank you for framing it for a session with regards to senior management and the compensation as well next question the criteria incidence technique of employee performance appraisal requires raters to select statements that fit the performance characteristics of individuals, select the highest and lowest performing employee in a work unit, record the degree which, spe which, which specified behaviors are performed, and record behaviors of employees that are related to both good and poor performance. So this would take a um, uh, a look-see at this particular definition. I, I was, and that's familiar with the critical incidence technique of employee performance. So this is purely a definition of looking at positive and negative sides to an employer uh, performance, employee. Um, so some of you have uh, A and D, and I don't think that's um, uncommon when you look at this question, because you know we've kind of told you, look at performance performance related to um, the uh, job description and so forth. But this is purely a definition question that uh, you'll just want to look up critical incidents techniques. And then um, so the answer here as people are putting in uh, is D, correct. A quick yeah. comment. Um, and this is, um, you know, one of those areas that I haven't really um, experienced in my in my last few years of my jobs because depends on how large of an organization you are in and some of these techniques may not be relevant for you. So you may not have experienced it firsthand. Um, one thing I did realize that this exam that I took almost had, I think five or six questions related to employee performance uh, techniques and tools. Um, I just happened to skim some of them, but I'm pretty sure I missed a couple of them just because I wasn't even familiar with the term. So it's always good to kind of, I think the book that was um, recommended by ACHE, which I did read uh, is a pretty good book I've seen. It's pretty extensive. Uh, it helps to at least skim through and, and remember to read some of those topics. And I agree. I think it's the well-managed healthcare book that we um, have recommended. And uh, if you were to purchase the group of books from ACHE, that's one of them that um, is, uh, covers this as well. We'll go to the last question. Okay, this is going to take you back to your um, organizational development um, coursework that you did to get where you're at, according to Hertzberg's hygiene and motivators theory of motivation. And I would ask you to really write out some of the motivators and some of the theories that you'll come into. And then as we look at hygiene and motivators theory of motivation, cleanliness of the workplace plays an important role in motivation. Um, you know, that that is a distractor 
but it's a cute one too. Um, the absence of adequate compensation can be a dissatisfier, but the presence of adequate compensation is not a motivator. Employees are motivated by money and factors intrinsic to the job itself. And extrinsic exit factors outside of us are prime motivators outside of ourselves. So I think as people are remembering their Hertzbergs, um, we're looking at the absence of adequate compensation can be a dissatisfier, but the president, presence of adequate compensation is not a motivator. And that's what I remember as well. And I remember that um, money is not a motivator, though can lead to low morale and demoralization if not viewed as fair or adequate. And that was kind of the themes that uh, were, I was brought up with in terms of management within the, um, and um, B, so B um, is the answer I would have selected. And what do we have? Jerry, why not D? Uh, well, outside of ourselves, extrinsic factors, not, not intrinsic, including um, uh, I feel um, that I'm using my best skills. I'm, I'm feeling that I have created a, a model where I'm reaching uh, Maslow's hierarchy <laughs> uh, are not prime motivators. So money, um, generally speaking, money, extrinsic, aren't what motivates us. And um, Rick, add anything I missed on that one. No, I, I, that's right. I think, uh, and I like the link to Maslow that um, that Hertzberg is really looking at the top levels of Maslow as the motivators. The difference is that he says that uh, Maslow says the lower levels do actually motivate you, um, where Hertzberg says no, they just if they're not there, they're going to demotivate you. Great, thank you. That's a good analogy. All right, well, that took us through HR. Good job, all. <laughs> Good job with answering the questions. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. So uh, before we will, uh, you know, uh, show our supplemental questions for both, uh, both uh, finance and HR, we'd like uh, to ask the participants for any questions related to uh, the uh, uh, two uh, knowledge areas. I do appreciate the question that came through about are all the subject areas grouped in the exam? And like, nope, nope. they're all scattered throughout. There's random <laughs> order. Sorry. <laughs> so I, uh, okay. So, uh, I just want to let everyone know that the next questions that we'll be uh, presenting to you, uh, we took the, uh, those from the uh, flashcards. So if you avail of the flashcard, you'll be able to see these questions. So um, I think you can, uh, you can uh, avail the flashcards through the HAHE website and uh, you can use that as a, as a tool for your uh, uh, review preparation. So uh, let's probably start with the supplemental question. Uh, Twee, can you bring it up? Okay. Finance. Okay. All right. So uh, this question asks, a set of medical codes used to report medical, surgical, and diagnostic procedures and services. So uh, first choice, uh, CPT codes. Uh, well, CPT codes do include medical, surgical, and diagnostic procedures and services. So that would be probably uh, a likely answer. DRG, they're really, um, they're really um, categorizing patients with similar diagnosis. So probably not B. And then ICD-10, um, you're really uh, you're basically are classifying coding all the diagnoses and symptoms. So that doesn't seem like a likely definition. So I, I think A is probably the best choice here. Oh, and that's NOMED, that refers to the EHR. Um, and how you capture, record, and report clinical data. Yeah. So we're getting a lot of A's. Oh, we got A, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, ratios that measures the organization long-term liquidity by measuring a variety of relationships to capital. Uh, fixed asset ratio, probably not, because it's really measuring just fixed asset to the debt used to finance um, your fixed assets. Capital structure ratios we talked about earlier, 
Um, it considers both um, equity and debt and short and long-term debt. Um, so that, that will be a likely answer. Unrestricted net assets and liquidity ratios really don't involve, um, uh, liquidity ratio is really current and unrestricted net assets doesn't have anything to do with um, what the question's being asked. So I think the likely answer here is gonna be B. Which everybody sounds, most people sounds like they pretty much guessed that. Okay, next one. Um, the process of converting operating plan into budgets for capital expenditures. Well, the question asked about, it mentions budgets and capital expenditures. So um, looking through the choice of the answers here, B capital budgeting would be a, a logical guess. Operating revenue doesn't, it really doesn't speak to the capital expenditures. Uh, financial strategic plan doesn't really have anything to do with what they're asking. And then working capital is your current assets, your current liabilities. So probably the best answer here is, it sounds like a lot of people have guessed already would be uh, B. Okay, uh, print, submit, uh, print bill, submit bill, follow up on a bill and collect bill or bill resolution. Uh, this sounds a lot like um, what revenue cycle is really, that's all the clinical and administrative functions, but it sounds a lot like what goes through a payment cycle um, and really not anything to do with the service cycle cost or an operating cycle. Uh, so I think, um, Payment cycle, just logically, these are all the things we do as part of the payment cycle, which you see. And resources that an organization expects to consume within one year. Um, so what, uh, if you consume um, uh, something within a year, that's based on currently what's happening in your um, operating cycle. So the non-current assets can be eliminated Deferred revenue, it could be current or long-term. And then um, current assets, you're consuming those assets. So I think D is a logical choice. Okay, uh, if, uh, if uh, you observe that most of the questions are knowledge-based from the flashcards, so uh, this, uh, this questions are useful in, 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 the, in the exam because you'll be able to apply this. You have the basic knowledge of the terms and in the, in the actual exam, it will ask you the application of those uh, basic terms. So just a, just a reminder. So, so uh, Sherry, if I can interrupt right before you start. If we're talking about the flashcards, these are what you can get from ACHE. I believe that the newer ones are a little larger. But what you'll see is like, for example, for the knowledge area for finance, you can either start with the definition, try to guess the answer, and that there are references on the flashcard itself. And when you purchase this, you have access to the electronic version through the ACHE learning site. You can put it on an app on your phone, um, you can access it on your computer and you can you can ask it to ask definitions for the, the answer back, flip back and forth. So people have found that very, very useful. Sorry, Sherry. No, perfect. I appreciate you stating that because we did, uh, we do want to help out with as many tools as possible and uh, get you real comfortable for the exam. So thank you so much, Nora, for giving us the update on the um, flashcards. All right, human resources, we'll go through a few and, and I appreciate those folks that are putting their answers in. Um, this is a funny one as we go back again to our organizational development or some of the theories is the theory that employees in an organization will be promoted to their highest level of competence and then be promoted to and remain at a level at which they are incompetent. <laughs> um, as you uh, remember this, if people are putting it in, um, that would be, and a theory, if, if you were, weren't familiar with the Peter Principle, which we've heard about is uh, moving people up that aren't as competent uh, is within that theory. Uh, you'll just look at principle theory versus the others are actions, internal recruitment, external inbreeding recruitments. Uh, those are, would be more actions where a principle is uh, defined as B. So thank you, good job all. 
Next one. Um, a non-binding type of dispute resolution in which a neutral third party attempts to assist in negotiations between the two primary parties. So again, a big question, a long question. Just uh, this is where you take your breath, breathe in through your heart, breathe out. <laughs> and then just look at non-binding, what that means, dispute resolution and neutral. And um, so you've been given three different definitions and we look at negotiate. So as we look at those answers that are provided, A, B, C, um, those don't really pertain to neutral and so forth and uh, non-binding. So you're answering D. Many of you may have been in a mediation process or have had uh, HR cases that have gone through that, and this gives you that experience. But this is a good one as you look at this question, is to take those A, B, C, and just write out what those quick definitions would be for you and D, mediation, so that you kind of have a quick definition in your mind when you go through the questions um, on the exam. Next one. A ratio um, that provides a summary of the gross movement in and out of a staff in an organization during a specific time. So a ratio is a comparison of two numbers and there, the term is used frequently throughout the exam. We've talked about it quite a bit in finance. And um, so when you look at a comparison of two numbers, uh, you're gonna be thinking about that ratio, comparison of two numbers, comparison of two numbers. And when you look at gross movement, meaning the large movement in and out of staff in an organization during a specific period of time, you're gonna be thinking about a large number. So um, as we look at a ratio that moves folks in and out of an organization, um, a lot of you are answering uh, A, uh, why it wouldn't be retention rate, obviously that isn't calling movement in and out. So I've really looked at these words, movement in and out and recruitment strategy technique. Again, that's a technique, not a rate. And a vacancy rate doesn't tell you about movement in and out. It tells you what you don't have right now in the organization. Um, so turnover rate is the correct answer. We, we've talked a lot about that in all professions, nursing, physicians, um, uh, but within- Sorry. I'm still not sure about sorry. that. <laughs> Within an organization, you're, you're looking at turnover rate. Sorry, I'm still not sure sorry about that. Sorry about that. That's my Siri acting up. But good job, all. U.S. labor law passed in response to U.S. Supreme Court decisions that limited their rights of employees who had sued their employee. Uh, and I think it should be their employers for discrimination um, in that uh, and you're going to look at this again from that perspective as you've written out. And I created a table for the Civil Rights Act, what it, Equal Pay Act, Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Act, and um, so forth. So as you look at this question, you're just going to go back slowly and look at Supreme Court decision that limited the rights of employees who had sued their employers for discrimination. Um, and as we look at that question, um, we are going to look at a big, broad topic, a big, broad um, answer for this. So um, we'll look at the answer again. And a lot of folks have put in A. Correct. Um, good job. It, it's looking at the broadest answer for this, the dis Supreme Court decision. Next one. Um, health professions, and we'll look at this in terms of a broader answer as well, therapists, medical, radiology technicians, social workers, health educators, and other ancillary personnel are called, Let's see what people want to answer here. Answer a. A. Good, good, good answer. Correct. Uh, and this again, in the, in the, um, book on uh, manage, well-managed health care. It goes into some of the definitions here on allied health professionals. It'll talk about it in terms of uh, different uh, licensing needs and different certifications and so forth, which is all part of the HR topic. Our next question. The result of a practice that may appear to be neutral 
but has a discriminatory effect is called. And this, these are these are um, definitions again. You'd you'd want to look at this, um, a practice, and um, confirm confirmative action. That's that's kind of a distractor there. Confirmative action, <laughs> affirmative action um, uh, is uh, disparate impact and disparate treatment. And uh, I think people are, uh, and, and that wouldn't be uncommon for you to look at uh, between C and D. Yeah. Um, but uh, C, uh, next answer please is, um, C. go I, ahead. Well, um, they've got the answer up, but um, the key is I kept going back and forth between C and D. So I went back to the question and said the result of a practice. If it had said a practice that may appear, then I think I'd want treatment but the result of the practice is going to be the impact. Excellent point, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect job dissecting the question. <laughs> Thank you. And that, that's a good good point. If you if you if you are um, sort of going back and forth between two answers, um, because the way they write these questions is one could be right, but uh, is what Rick just took us through, and that that's a perfect example of it. Just go back and reread it again and see if it pops up, so thank you. Federal agency responsible for ending employment discrimination and uh, files lawsuits on behalf of alleged victims of discrimination in the workplace. And uh, we'll know an agency. Uh, so that kind of takes you to um, an agency. <laughs> so we can answer this question. So it's kind of, a, 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 and uh, people are answering it correct, an agency versus the others aren't truly agencies. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sherry, for uh, you know going through with the questions. Um, I think um, that's uh, that's what we have for you today. And uh, I think uh, if you have any additional uh, housekeeping, Nora, do you have anything for uh, for the for the group? Uh, reminders: uh, They should have uh, received their links to the to the recording, pre-recorded top for the pre-recorded links for the topic today. Yeah, um, I sent out, I put on the chat. Those of you that did not receive either the follow-up session one email or the pre-work for session two, um, I put mine and and Twee's email out out there to contact us. I've already had a, a few contact me. Um, and if several of you that may have registered after we first sent stuff out to may not have received it, um, but let me know and we'll get we'll get stuff out to you. In particular, we need to know if we missed you on our list. So that'll be helpful. Thank you. Okay. I have a uh, question for uh, James and probably well, Sachin and, and Michael just recently took the exam too, so maybe the three of them. Um, for preparing for finance, since that seems to intimidate a lot of people, including me, if you know the ratios and you know the uh, financial statements, it seems like that in itself is going to give you a good chunk of the questions. Is that, yeah, is that I would, true? Yeah, I would say so. I, I think that just what I'm seeing um, based reviewing the material is just Having a um, a general understanding of you know of, of the financial statements and what what the ratios are and the purpose behind them um, should be you know I think um, that's really what you need um, uh, is just to really the the relevance and the purpose behind it, both financial statements and ratios are, are important. Um, not a not a detailed one, but just just uh, uh, understand the concepts behind them. I think it's key. I agree. Uh, one other thing, uh, it's not the right way to think about uh, taking an exam, but I also look at all of the ten um, domains, and uh, the exam isn't testing you or having you to qualify on each of those areas. It's an aggregate score across all exams. So if you're not strong at finance, don't fret. Uh, focus on the nine others, uh, even if they are smaller weightage, 
but you might still scrape through without actually worrying about finance. Yeah, and I, I didn't see, well, there's, there was nothing in there, at least the questions I went through that, where you had to memorize, um, I think, um, just understanding the ratios and the purpose behind them, but not having to memorize all the calculations. It didn't seem like it asked for that. It was just more, you know, these different ratios, what, what they're really used for. So the concepts behind those ratios, I think that that was a key uh, point that the questions were trying to get across. And also understanding of the balance sheets is also important. So because there are some questions about balance sheets. Well, yeah, and, uh, I would, all, uh, yeah, and that, I think um, really understanding all the financial statements, you know, between cash flow, balance sheet, income statement, statement changes in equity are important. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, if there are no more questions, um, uh, we will give you uh, two minutes gift of time. <laughs> and we hope to uh, see you again next week. Our topic will be uh, healthcare uh, leadership and uh, business knowledge, management and leadership and business knowledge. So uh, we would like to, uh, you know, hope to see you again next week, same time and same place and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone.